Welcome everyone, welcome to Marketplace 2. Um, my name's um, Paul Lunt and we're um, going to be hearing uh, two presentations today. The first by uh, Gay Jones, Rebel Botanist, and um, Gay is going to be talking about the problems of plant blindness and our inability to appreciate the diversity of plants. Uh, the Rebel Botanist movement aims to awaken our recognition of plants, uh, making connections by chalking plant names in Banksy S. Uh, street art, so a kind of uh, conscious raising in a fun and creative way. And this work has been featured on uh, the BBC and uh, radio, uh, but unfortunately, Gay can't be with us um, live today. Uh, so we'll be uh, watching a presentation, pre-prepared presentation that, uh, that Gay's produced for us. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for attending this session about the Plymouth Rebel Botanists. I'm very sorry that I can't be doing this live so that I can't take any questions at the end of the, the session, but I hope you'll find it of some interest anyway. And also there are addresses, our Facebook page, for example, at the end of the PowerPoint presentation, which I hope if you want to have any questions or follow up or keep track of what we're doing, you will actually make a note and, um, and follow us on that. That would be wonderful. I have here a short PowerPoint presentation, which um, I'll, I'll, I will go through and then speak a little bit more about the, the things that we've done, discovered, and, um, and hope that it will be, it'll pique your interest and, uh, and you will want to see, see what else is happening locally and nationally with this movement. So, Blackbird in a Thrush. When did you last stop and listen to the sonorous soliloquy of the blackbird? Think about it. It could be quite a while ago. Apparently, when Theodore Roosevelt visited Britain in 1910 as president, I quote, he was aghast at the local indifference to the music of the blackbird. In 1999, two researchers, Van der Zee and Schusler, wrote a paper on what they termed plant blindness as failing to see, notice, or focus attention on plants in one's daily life, and thereby not recognizing their important connection to biodiversity. It would also appear that the problem is not just one of indifference, but of genocide. Crook and Short present an argument that ecocide can be a method of genocide if environmental destruction results in conditions of life that fundamentally threaten a social group's cultural and or physical existence. Given that statistics show a devastating decline of many of our wildlife species, this argument would seem to have strong evidence. Pesticides, those toxic chemical cocktails, are sold like sweets on the supermarket and garden centre shelves, but they're poisonous, causing death and chronic disease to insects, birds, mammals and humans. Exposure has been linked to Parkinson's disease, asthma, depression, anxiety, ADHD, and cancer. Pesticides can be persistent, staying in soils and plants for years, continuing to poison every visiting wildlife creature and you if you grow your own vegetables. It doesn't matter how organic you are yourself, if they have had any kind of spray before they arrive in garden centers, that will be carried on for a very long time. A range of pesticides also been found on plants marked up as bee friendly in well-known retailers, garden centers and so on. This has to be a form of greenwashing. It's a marketing spin to deceive and persuade the public that their products, policies and principles are environmentally friendly, but we have a very long way to go putting pressure on them to get them to really clean up their act. 
And with the current urgent focus to help protect the habitat of wildlife against man-made destruction, still much more needs to happen and quickly, which is why the rebel botanists movement came into being in April 2020. We aim to raise public consciousness to recognise, respect and react positively to nature through ethical and caring conservation practices. We do this by chalking the common and Latin names of plants we find amongst the cracks and crevices of public streets and pathways. We write messages to show that in nature nothing happens in isolation. Context and connections are paramount. Once you start noticing these wild plants, they become important. When van der Zee and Schusler wrote their plant blindness paper in 1999, 12.5% of plants were threatened with extinction. 22 years later, that figure has risen to 40%. So we have clearly achieved very little in that time. Education is needed desperately to show that all species have a very important role in our ecology. They each have their own distinct name, and there's no place for referring to plants as weeds and therefore unwanted. By raising awareness through our unconventional Banksy-esque street art education, we'll combat plant blindness and encourage curiosity, respect and engagement with wild flowers and wildlife habitats. These are our contact details. If you'd like to carry on this taking this further to help save our natural world, please get in touch with us. We'd, we'd be delighted to, to see you and have you on board as, as another rebel botanist. I just wanted to draw out some of the things, how we started and, uh, and what we're doing to supplement the presentation. Um, as, as I said, we started just over a year ago, originally inspired by an article in the Guardian. The article in the Guardian was by the French botanist Boris Peresek of Toulouse Museum of Natural History. He said, I wanted to raise awareness of the presence, knowledge and respect of these wild plants on sidewalks. People who have never taken the time to observe these plants now tell me their view has changed. This is because he went out chalking the names of these overlooked plants on city pavements and found that the response was actually far greater than he'd anticipated. The same, same was true for us. Last spring, last year, the early spring and the council's no May, no May policy of not cutting back verges and green spaces produced a wonderful crop of early flowers. When we first went out, armed with our chalks, we realised that our own knowledge of these flowers, names and attributes was pretty limited to our childhood memories. And we had to set about finding out how to ID them. Fortunately, there's a very wide range of books out there. Plenty of small books that you can put into your back pocket. Others, as backup, Richard Maybe's wonderful Flora Britannica, which is quite a tome and would not fit into anyone's back pocket. But there's a huge number of resources to be found. Charity shops will almost certainly have a very useful little pocketbook of wildflower recognition. And the other thing that we used is, was, was apps. In particular, we've been using one called Seek, iNaturalist. This is a, a citizen's app, in effect. It builds on all the information produced around the globe based in California with the um, University of Stanford and uh, with the backup of National Geographic. It's not foolproof, it's not 100% definite, but it does give you a very good idea, particularly of the common plants, and we found it hugely useful. <clears throat> and we also discovered it was wonderfully enjoyable and completely fascinating to do it. And to our amazement, it had a massively positive response from passers-by, which none of us were actually used to. Our campaigns have tend tended to be minority or not very popular. So that was really encouraging. So with time, we, we started to add Latin names to our chalking, and sometimes how they supported wildlife, pollinators and birds, etc. And we realised, crucially, that once you give something a name, you also give it a value. So we were stopped referring to weeds, as I said, and prefer simply wildflowers for this reason. This thing called plant blindness, this is a real thing, which is an unfortunate evolutionary tendency to overlook the unthreatening things in our vicinity. Little green plants, even with colorful flowers sprouting out of pavements and in our surroundings, generally simply go unnoticed. 
And it's unfortunate because our lives depend on them. <clears throat> Just as the lives of insects, pollinators, and all manner of wildlife depend on them. We know now how interconnected all life is and that human life can't afford to trash any aspect of the natural world around us because in so doing, we trash ourselves. We've also inadvertently initiated the re revival of a small pocket park close to the university here. We visited several city parks last year to chalk and ID plants and we found ourselves in Handiscombe, pl Handiscombe Park just up the road from the university. It's a small triangle of tall old trees and grass and a few shrubs and some overgrown earth, mostly with asters, mythomus daisies, bluebells in spring, and a few others. It's almost it's practically a monoculture. We felt it could be so much more than this and have worked with the council, with Green Minds and with Earth Jump to revive it. And we're hoping that it will become part of the citywide bee line network. Bees and other pollinators need unbroken lines of support to enable them to flourish, be they parks, gardens, cemeteries or green verges. The council's opened it up with a new path, two more entrances and some new seating, and we've held planting days there, using largely donated plants to introduce much needed diversity and putting up bat and bird boxes. Already we've noticed that more people are using it and local neighbours have joined in enthusiastically in caring for its upkeep so far, which has been hugely encouraging. But our main focus remains raising awareness of the green world around us. I, I could go on because there's so much work and education needed to be done to encourage people to simply see what's around us and to stop thinking that verges, etc., needs tidying up. We all need to know that green areas should be left to flower, to sell seed and to support wildlife reproducing in the early summer, as well, as well as creating wildflower meadows wherever possible. We work with the council to support this, to encourage them and challenge them to go still further. And they need our support too. Please let them know when you see something that you appreciate. This is a heartfelt plea because for every appreciative email they get, they get about 70 emails complaining and they're desperate to have ammunition to let people know that this is deliberate. So we need to counter those who think that short green grass and sterile pavements and back alleys are what they should be providing everywhere. So before I end, I'd just like to finish with the, a quotation from the Senegalese conservationist Baba Doom, who wrote some years back, in the end, we will only conserve what we love. We will only love what we understand, and we will only understand what we are taught. So I hope you will join us in this process of self-education and passing on that information to other people as part of this, this wonderful, now global movement of rebel botanists. Thank you very much. again thank you for providing us with that um, excellent presentation uh, what an innovative and exciting project and i particularly like that uh, uh, last quote being involved in education and having a love of, of um, plants perhaps there's some um, interesting points being raised in the, in the discussion we could come back to that maybe at the end uh, but uh, for now we're going to move on to the um, second speaker for this um, session uh, Claire Willestein. Claire is from the um, Cornwall Climate Care. Uh, that's an education and environmental film charity uh, with the aim to raise awareness of what climate change will mean to the people of Cornwall, in particular engaging people with positive stories and innovative ways that people can tackle climate change, uh, particularly with a focus on secondary schools. So I think we're, we're in for a treat because Claire's going to show us um, little clips from uh, two of the films that they've um, recently produced. So I'll hand over to Claire now. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, I hope, hope everybody hear me. Um, yes, so uh, we are Cornwall Climate Care. We're a registered charity um, which set up just about a year ago now. And uh, we are making this, uh, these are just a few sort of outtakes from our filming we've done over the past few months. We are making um, a series of films about climate change in Cornwall. Um, this is an absolutely dreadful photo. I don't know why it's the only one of us together, but that's me on the left. I'm the producer. And uh, this is Bryony Stokes, who's the director of the films. 
So um, it's a series of 30 minute documentaries, um, which is going to take us a, a few years actually to make. We're producing about one every four months and um, they're, they're on a variety of themes, um, as you can see there. Uh, we've produced two so far. We're, we're just about to launch our second one, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, really, one of the main aims for doing this is that uh, we, Cornwall Council, like I think Plymouth City Council and, and many other councils, um, is going one better than our, our national government and aiming to be carbon neutral by 2030, um, which is an incredibly bold ambition for Cornwall. Um, because our emissions are actually the fourth highest in the UK for a variety of reasons, largely down to our really poor public transport. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, we, we hear a lot about all these great targets that are being set nationally and internationally and by our councils. But, you know, often these targets don't actually really hold up to much uh, scrutiny when you when you look at where we're actually at and how much work has to be done to get there. Um, we're going to have to cut our emissions in Cornwall by about 10% every year to be able to reach that target. And we're nowhere near that at the moment. So we really need, need to all be on the same page and we're trying to support that. And one of the ways that we're doing that is by trying to make the climate emergency locally relevant. Um, I, I feel, we feel that um, so often when you hear about climate change, we're hearing terrible stories about things that are happening in Bangladesh or forest fires in Australia or what's happening in the Arctic. Um, but it also seems very, very distant or very far off in the future. And um, as the previous speaker, Gay, was saying, you know, in that great quote at the end, it is very much about um, make, making people understand um, and, and that you will care about what you understand. And I think people need to or pe it would help if people could understand what is happening locally. Um, it, it would make it more more relevant and more important to them. And we're also focusing very much on making sure that these films aren't all doom and gloom. Um, you know, much as I love Greta Thunberg, you know, that kind of narrative evidently really switches off a lot of people. Um, so we're, we're very much sort of focusing as well on positive and inspiring stories from Cornwall to try and give people a sense of pride in the place where they live. We've got loads of great stuff here. Um, you know, from the world's first electric ferry to all the amazing developments uh, with the deep geothermal heat. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we need to celebrate these things to try and motivate people to do their part as well. So the background to this, um, I set up and ran for eight years a local beach cleaning group called Rain Peninsula Beach Care. We, we didn't only do beach cleaning. We actually did a lot of um, plastics campaigning as well. Um, with quite a lot of success and we were just one of a huge number of groups that set up and proliferated around Cornwall over the past sort of five or ten years. Beach cleaning um, is a very very positive thing of course and, um, and, and it's one of those few things where you can actually go out and you can do something about a real environmental crisis right on our doorstep. You know it's hard to do anything particularly about orangutans or, or, or polar bears but we have all this plastic washing up on our shores and obviously people have really, really taken it to heart. But what I discovered over the years, going to lots of different conferences and, um, and, and events and talking to marine science experts was a deep sense of frustration um, because it's almost as though we've become so um, focused on plastic that it's it's been to the exclusion of everything else. Um, it's not a controversial thing. It's very, very visible. It's very evident. You can see what the impacts are and you can see what the problem is. Um, and, and there's no sort of politics involved in plastic. But they would say, you know, we, we really hope that the, the plastic issue is going to be almost like a springboard that will make people more aware about other uh, things affecting the ocean and what can be done about them. You know, primary among them climate change, which obviously is, is having so many impacts on so many levels. Um, but it, we just don't see that happening. It's almost as though the sort of huge public interest in plastic is driving um, government action and it's driving research. But we need to move away from just this narrow focus and, and look at the, the wider issues as well. Um, so personally, I, I've started to feel that really we ought to be reframing the, the plastic crisis um, in public debate more as part of the climate emergency. Because it is, it is a climate issue. You know, plastic is emitting, um, is, is is producing large amounts of emissions at every stage from its life cycle, right from from extraction to disposal. 
Um, and that's only going to get worse. I mean, some figures are saying that we're looking at a tripling of plastic produ production over the next 20 years, which is just um, incredible. Um, and I've started to think more and more, you know, we, we should look at it as a climate issue because we could take all those plastics from the beach. We, you know, even if it was possible, we could remove all the microplastics, everything from the sea, and we would still be left with this much wider overarching issue of climate change. But conversely, um, if we address climate change, that would also impact on plastic production and pollution. So um, the first film that we made, which I'm just about to show you the trailer for, um, was uh, re really my story, this, this sort of journey that I'd been on from um, beach cleaning to, to looking more at the, cl the climate side of things. And uh, I'm, I'm just gonna show you the, the, the trailer for that now. Plastic. Plastic. The amount of plastic. I've watched mums come out for 15 days to try and feed a dead pup. We've lost 60% of our colonies in the last 20 years. Unless we do something very rapidly, we are going to see really serious consequences in the next 10 to 20 years. You can make everything out of it that is now produced by oil. It can solve the world's problem. It can store carbon like 35 times more than our rainforest. We've got the know-how and we shouldn't be building stuff in the sea if it's not going to benefit the sea life as well. Ooh, oh no. <laughs> oh no, what have I done? Oh, crikey. Plastic. Plastic. I'm, oh no, I knew I was going to be the one to cough up on the... Right, I'm so sorry about that. And I hope the sound was all right because I couldn't hear it very well. So um, w w what we realised, though, after making this film um, was that really we're just reaching the same sort of usual suspect audience. You know, um, th this is going to get to people who are already engaged and interested and aware about environmental issues. Um, so what we're, we've decided we really want to try and do with this project is to reach people who aren't usually part of the climate or even the environmental conversation um, and, and listen to what they have to say. So um, each film is uh, actually pre presented by a different person. So I presented the first one, but the second one and, and other ones will be presented by people who are relevant to that topic to try and give it um, real sort of legitimacy to people who are involved in that area, be it farming or healthcare or whatever it is. Um, and, and really to try and sort of bring down the heat on the, the climate change issue, um, which has obviously, as we know, it's become so sort of polarised. Um, I've certainly experienced that myself, you know, um, I, I, I went to our parish council a couple of years ago to try and ask them to declare a climate emergency and I was just completely unprepared for the, for the pushback and level of actual hostility, um, which I just didn't realise exist, be existed because I'm surrounded by people who think the same as I do. So, you know, evidently we're only going to have any hope of, of really um, acting enough if, if we can sort of uh, reach reach people in, and change hearts. Um, and also we really want to bring in the whole sort of issues of um, Cornwall's social social situation. So of course we do have all this well-beating technology and research going on in Cornwall that we want to highlight and celebrate but at the same time we're also one of the very poorest areas in, in Europe. Um, and uh, you know we have a huge number of people here living in fuel poverty and transport poverty and unless those issues are addressed, um, we're never going to get anywhere. So the next film that we're making, which is being launched on the 1st of July, um, is doing just this, trying to, to reach a, 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 a sector of society that maybe doesn't normally get involved in, in environmental conversations, and that's our fishermen. Um, so this film, Plenty More Fish, <clears throat> it's looking at uh, climate impacts on, on Cornwall's fishing industry. It's being presented by this guy, Ben Church, who's one of our local fishermen here. He's absolutely fantastic. And um, it's been an, a real revelation for me, um, given what I've been doing for the past years, making this film, because so many of my conversations with fishermen in the past have been um, quite fraught because they've been about, you know, me probably shouting about bycatch or plastic or sustainability. And actually being able to talk to fishermen in a, in a really sort of um, un, un hostile way 
about uh, their experiences. And of course, they are like research vessels. What they're pulling up out of the sea is changing so much. And uh, they just had amazing stories to tell. And um, it was it was really great to be able to have those conversations with them. And this, I hope the sound's going to be all right, um, is the trailer for the second film. Pollution. Quota. Rules and regulations. Brexit. There's not many young people. For us Cornish fishermen, climate change seems to be a far off problem. But I'm not the only one to have started seeing changes. We're seeing in the last two years probably a degree difference, if not more. You would have to be there to see what's coming up, to say there's something wrong here. The weather patterns definitely seem like they're changing. With increased storminess, that's posing a greater physical risk for fishermen. Why are we sieving fish from the sea when there might be other ways that we can do that? There's jobs that people have been doing here for 30 or 40 years that have sort of ceased to exist. Fishermen are very adaptive and we've got more diversity in Cornwall than anywhere else. Becoming carbon neutral for a fishing boat would be a real advantage. It would be good for the environment and it would be good for marketing. There's new fisheries emerging as new fish come. It's incredible to give something back, I think. Yeah, you never know what we've got on the horizon, really. We didn't expect this. Overfishing, pollution, oh, quota. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, oh no, how did I get out of this last time? Right. Sorry, I don't know what I've done there. Anyway, so yes, this film is launching on um, the 1st of July. We've got an online um, live stream launch with a Q&A with quite a few participants taking part. Um, so uh, please do join in if, if you'd like to. It, you can get uh, tickets through there for free through Eventbrite. There'll be a, a link at the end. Um, as, as you can probably imagine, this is not Seaspiracy, this film. And um, this is very much about trying to, as I said, sort of trying to make everybody part of the conversation. So um, we're not telling people not to eat fish, um, but we are looking at issues around um, climate and sustainability uh, in what we're eating. You know, the fish that we traditionally like to eat, like cod, is no longer caught in the UK. It's all caught up around Norway and Russia. Um, you know, why aren't we eating more of what we're catching? We're actually exporting 90% of what we catch in the UK and importing 90% of what we eat. Um, it's about letting the fishermen tell their own stories, um, about increased storminess and the impact that that's having on them, and, and really looking at what we can do as consumers to help make a difference. And also looking at some of those positive stories, like I said before, um, which, which there are, you know, and some really interesting stuff going on around um, trying to make fishing boats carbon neutral. Um, and lastly, um, as, as Paul mentioned, a big part of our work is around schools. Um, I was absolutely shocked when I discovered um, through the campaign group Teach the Future on some surveys that they've done, only 4% of students feel they know very much about climate change. And 75% of teachers don't feel that they have actually had enough training to be able to teach about it. And I think there's um, fear among a lot of teachers as well about um, uh, addressing this issue with a class just for fear of unleashing eco anxiety and, and how do you address that um, so we've, we've been working with a team of teachers to produce a whole range of materials for um, GCSE and A-level ages to go with the films and um, so we've just um, put out the first batch to go with our first film under the surface um, and uh, also that they're, they're not just in science and geography so that's pretty much where you will learn about climate change at school now if you do um, in a very conceptual way in science you might learn about atmospheric chemistry and the water cycle if you do geography you know you might um, have case studies about different places in the world but we're um, obviously using these local films and across the curriculum so there's materials for English there'll be things for art and business studies and media studies um, to really sort of try and internalize this topic and, and make it um, talked about at all levels and also, you know, of course, we need to be preparing young people today for jobs in the future green economy. So um, I hope I haven't rambled on for too long and sorry about the glitches. Um, <laughs> that's uh, that's me. Um, the, the next episode, which is going to be um, called Living on the Edge, I think, and is all about Cornwall's coastal communities, uh, sea level rise, erosion and storms is going to be coming out in the autumn. Um, and then next year, we're going to be coming up onto dry land. Um, please do follow us on, on social media or get in touch on the website there um, if you would like to um, if, if you would like to see the live launch of the film. Thanks very much.
No, I don't know. Stop sharing. Thank you, Claire. That was excellent. And uh, yeah, actually, it was fairly smooth. So the um, it's difficult, isn't it, when you're running videos? But uh, it was fairly smooth. So well, well done you, from my end, anyway. Um, yeah, this is really exciting, really, really exciting project. I mean, I can see some questions coming in now. Um, I think the the, um, the issue about um, climate change teaching is something that really surprised me, and there's a there's a point being raised there. Now, that four percent sounded quite dire, and I kind of you think about the next generation, you think that they are perhaps more aware than uh, than we were. But, but that so that is really really quite surprising. So in I didn't <laughs> I thought you were going on something else. Yes, um you're you're absolutely right. I mean I'm a parent of two teenagers. I've got a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old and I do quiz them about stuff that they learn at school and um it's 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 extraordinary. I mean my daughter actually came home one day and she'd been asked in a lesson to list all the positives of climate change which I just found mind-blowing. Yeah. I mean, it's it's very important to provide a kind of a, a positive vision, isn't it, for for the future to to prevent the kind of climate anxiety, as as you said. In in relation to to that and the kind of um, fishing industry, is there much positivity in there? Is there much awareness within the fishing industry? Yeah, I was really surprised actually. I mean, of course, you know, the the people who we've spoken to in the film are people who who were open and wanted to talk to us so I can't talk for the whole fishing industry but um I think you know talking to the industry bodies there's certainly um there's certainly very much an understanding among fishermen that the the type of fish that they see has completely changed um and and they they do attribute that to climate change I mean you know one of the the big things is the arrival of the bluefin tuna in just massive numbers um you know which nobody's seen before anything like that um uh so you know they, they they are aware of this and they are aware of, of their impact as well i mean there's quite a lot of work being done and um, by the industry body sea fish to um uh, reduce the drag of nets to try because that's one of the the big um emissions related things and and also um norway have just uh produced their first a fully electric fishing vessel so you know down the line it, it is happening and I think there's all sorts of uh, looking at um, incorporating hydrogen technology into um, fishing boats as well obviously the big problem for them especially for the big offshore trawlers is they'll go off for a week you know there's no charging points 100 miles offshore and um, so there are quite a few challenges as well <laughs> um, but the real I, I think um, as, as one of the experts in the film says so interestingly um, actually Cornwall's almost in the Goldilocks zone and um, the UK so We've got a lot of sort of smaller bodied, faster reproducing fish coming up into our waters. The real problems are obviously up at the poles where the cold water fish are being forced further and further north and there's nowhere left for them to go. And down around the equator where fish are moving north into cooler waters. And, um, you know, that could really impact on on the millions of people in the tropics who depend on on fish for their livelihoods and diet. It's encouraging in a way because that rain shift is something obviously that the science has been reporting for a while with 300 or so new species coming into the UK waters. Um, so I suppose from that point of view, but it, it depends on uh, whether there's an awareness of that one, I suppose, which is the, the key thing. Yeah. Um, in relation to the plastic issue, then, there was quite a bit in the, in this conference about um, plastics, and of course, it is one that's caught the kind of uh, the the public's attention in particular over the last kind of uh, two two years or so. And uh, it's interesting that you are now showing that connectivity um, with um, with the kind of um, CO two emissions as well with the production use and, and and disposal of plastics. Is that is that gaining um, ground? Are people understanding that? Are they able to to, to kind of picture that oh crikey I don't know I hope so I hope that that you know our films are going to help them do that I think the trouble with climate change it's such a sort of overwhelming and scary and massive but kind of nebulous thing isn't it and um, you know I've done quite a lot of going out and about just in my area talking to people about climate change and the first thing that everybody says is oh well I do my recycling you know it's, it's almost as though everything boils down to plastic 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 um, you know, when really your recycling is such a small part of the issue. Um, I think people 
I, I think there is a huge level of concern um but i think people just don't really know what they can do you know um that can make a big difference and there's this real frustration as well obviously just this sort of awareness that whatever you can do as an individual you know we could all as individuals be doing as much as we could but you know really without those big changes from higher up the line it's not going to be enough is it yeah i mean it's it's a real challenge isn't it particularly i would have thought for filmmakers you've got a colorless odorless gas um you know from uh, you know and that is the root of the problem so you know things like plastics i suppose physical things like that that are, are horrific when uh, when you see the damaging impacts do uh, attract the, the media attention but but it's great you know that you're kind of taking that that interest and and um and kind of trying to widen it yeah i think it is just about sort of making it real and relevant for people here you know i mean i think there there is so much going on both positive and negative and, and people just aren't really aware or, or or events or storms or 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 heavy rains or landslides or whatever is sort of seen as kind of um discrete events and you know it's sort of framing them and making them part of this sort of wider international picture of what's actually happening globally um which which hopefully will make people put two and two together a bit more yeah i mean we, we um had a few comments uh, points earlier on um with relation to to gay jones's rebel um botanist presentation and and that's something certainly after my kind of own heart but there is a connectivity isn't there here about people's awareness of the environment and their surroundings and, and being more connected um, you know in terms of engaging with their natural environment which is really kind of key to to our future success of um, at least uh, in relation to, to climate change mitigation definitely yes and you know I mean so many people obviously did um, did, did really experience nature in a different way and appreciate it so much more during lockdown and you know hopefully that isn't going to be lost and uh, and, and, and will continue because um, you know we we are we are nature aren't we we're part of it and uh, we have to we have to work with it. That's great. Well, I'm just having a look in the the, um, the questions that we've got coming in. I think we've kind of um, dealt with them. Actually, it's interesting here that there's a there's a uh, a comment by Lucy um, Mottram who said about um, primary school primary schools in particular. So so is that an area where, where um, presumably your films um, can be viewed in, in at primary level as well? Is that a better age to capture young minds? Yeah, I mean, I'm very, very interested in this. I suppose we um, had thought and assumed that these films would work better for secondary level just because of the, the length of the films, the sort of concept in them, the sort of language involved but I've actually been contacted by quite a few primary teachers um, who are using sort of shorter excerpts from the films and actually one one primary school down at St Day um, where year six are making their own climate film and they've asked us to um, do a review of it for them um, and I, I mean it would be amazing to get primary schools on board it's just it's not really my area and um, but we definitely you know um, we, we would love to work with any primary schools who who would be um interested in, in engaging on this i i i'm not an expert and i don't know the best way of, of sort of dealing with such a big subject with such young children um but there's definitely some great stuff going on and we've got um ellie jackson in cornwall who's um written the wild tribe heroes series and she's produced a book um about a polar bear which is specifically aimed for primary age um all about climate change and um, and we've just had uh, a, a school up north get in touch as well, where all of their year six have produced a whole series about coastal change and coastal erosion for YouTube. So um, obviously there is a lot going on where there are passionate teachers. And, um, you know, if, if we can do anything to support that, that'd be great. I'm just looking in the chat here, actually, there's quite a few um, questions and also comments about um, sea level rise and, and uh, and coastal erosion in particular, which is obviously something which um, with Cornwall's extensive coastal um, area is is um, is quite significant. Is is that something that um, that you feel can be um, can be made into film? Um, is yeah, it something that 
this is actually our next film, the, the one that we're um, uh, going to be starting working on now, and it will be coming out in sort of October, November time. Yeah, there's there's loads of really interesting stuff going on. So we have Lou, which is the most flooded town in Britain, and we have Bude, which um, I think, according to the Environment Agency, is the most vulnerable to sea level rise of anywhere in Britain. Um, so this, this next film, um, I think it's going to be really great because it's going to be narrated by a woman who is um, going to be one of the first women ever to run the whole of the Southwest Coast Path. Um, and so she's narrating it starting um, at uh, Heartland Point and there'll be a drone sort of following her and then she's going to sort of pop up in different places talking about what's happening there and 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 the responses because um certainly i i didn't know um until quite recently how our coastlines have been divided up under our shoreline management plans into three different areas so you've got hold the line um where everything will be done to try and preserve those communities um managed realignment and no active intervention and actually nearly all of the Cornish coast is no active intervention so there's only a small number of places where um where where infrastructure work's going to be done Lou is going to probably have a huge tidal barrage put in place um uh Penzance well Mounts Bay they're looking at bringing in millions of tons of sand to create a, a sand engine um which will form a big sort of offshore sandbar to to protect the whole of Mounts Bay and the A30 and the railway line. But these are huge, you know, just for those two projects, you're looking at over £100 million. So obviously it's impossible to protect everywhere. Um, so, you know, I think this is something, again, that many people aren't aware of. So um, it's going to be a, an interesting conversation starter. Do you think that there's a question here, actually, from um, Naomi about um, the local population and do they feel that there are opportunities to move into to uh, renewables um, in as in employment? I I think there probably will be. I mean, um, the energy film for us is a bit further down the line, so I I don't know a huge amount about it. But um, you know, I think we're going to be looking at uh, having big floating offshore wind capacity. Obviously, there's you know Cornwall and of course. Devon as well in Dartmoor I mean we've got the, the the hottest rocks in the country I mean the potential for um the hot rock technology there for energy is is huge um obviously there's also the the project looking at extracting lithium from the the, the subterranean waters as well um which you know I know all these things are controversial but I suppose you sort of have to look look at the reality i mean we are going to be living in this future world of, of battery technology and we need lithium and when currently most of our lithium is coming from australia you know or, or or being taken out of waters under the the deserts in chile and and bolivia you know in ways that are having huge impacts and then being shipped to china to be processed and then being shipped back over here you know um that is potentially going to be a lesser evil isn't it and um I, I think things are going to change significantly over the next 10 or 20 years and you know it's going to be quite exciting to see i hope yeah honest conversations are um, required aren't they for for the changes that are required in, in in the future certainly there's a question actually which um do you intend to um expand your work beyond cornwall or um obviously you've got quite a lot on <laughs> Just making people of Cornwall yeah. aware, but I kind of wish that we had done. I mean, it's it's quite nice to sort of focus it on a geographical area in a place that we're from. Um, uh, I mean, I suppose you could do a whole UK wide one. We it would be great to sort of see other projects like this popping up in different parts of the country, wouldn't it? Um, with with people sort of documenting conversations around climate and what's happening in different places. But I do at least think that um, you know the the launch of our first film when we started this project it was before covid and we just thought that we this was all going to be community screenings and school screenings and obviously we had to do our first launch um online in february we we're absolutely blown away by the response we had about 1500 people um tune in for that live launch and there were people from new zealand and norway and spain which was absolutely incredible and i think there's a, a real interest in this sort of local views of a global topic um, and although we might not be talking about Kent or Yorkshire or anywhere else, I think for people in Kent and Yorkshire, what's happening here is more relevant and possibly interesting to them than maybe what's happening in Russia. 
Um, so hopefully these films can be used and can be of interest to people in, in other parts of the country. But we would love it if, um, you know, other other filmmakers wanted to do something similar elsewhere. And we are including quite a lot of Plymouth, it has to be said. You know, we've got quite a few people from Plymouth University and PML and, and Marine Biological Association um, taking part in the film. So we're kind of bleeding over the border a little bit. I think it's, yeah, that's great to hear Plymouth involved. I mean, certainly our environmental students here at the university are um, get involved in, in short um, documentary and filmmaking just because it's so important, you know, to change the hearts and minds of, of, of people. It's it's a key part. You know, the science is, is, is there. It's um, indisputable. It's, um, you know, it's about now making people aware and, and, and allowing them to kind of see a positive vision of the future. So that's where it's really great. Just looking at the time now, I think we're we're um, just about out of time. We're going to go into a um, a uh, coffee break in a moment, and then uh, we'll be back for the um, the workshop sessions after the break. But um, I'd just like to finish by thanking you very much for for your work and for your presentation and um, for joining us here today. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Bye for now. Bye.